appreciate you for your unyielding support. Um, this is the day that the Lord has made, and it is a good day. As Pastor Thompson said earlier, this is a glimpse of what glory looks like, that there's no division, that there's no segregation, that we come together to worship and honor God. Can you hear me okay? Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to be gathered in your presence with so many of your children, God, who representing all corners of society, Lord, and we say thank you for the glimpse of your glory. Now, Lord God, the preaching time has come, and so, Lord, I pray, as I always do, that I have prepared as best I know how. I've prayed as best as I know how to, God, and you must preach this word. Lord, I have studied all that I know how to study, God, but you must send your Holy Spirit. And I have written words on paper, God, but we pray that you would write them on our hearts, Lord God, that we might be drawn closer to you and closer to one another. Now, Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all of God's children said, amen. Amen, amen. amen. We're talking about the beloved community. That was the, the theme for this morning, and I hear for the year. And the text that was highlighted for this day comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 25 through 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 25 through 27. And it's in the middle of a chapter, um, so we just want to go there really quickly, and then we'll move on. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 25 through 27. Please stand if you are able. In verse, and it reads as follows, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And I just want to draw your attention back to verse 25. But the members may have the same care for one another. You may be seated. My favorite movie growing up was Annie. You know the story of Annie, the little red-headed orphan who gets to spend a week with Daddy Warbucks, and of course, by the end of the week, he wants this little girl to stay with her, and stay with him, rather. And there's music, and there's dancing, there's drama. It's a great movie for a young little girl. So when the remake came out a few years ago, I jumped at the opportunity to take my cousin's daughter to see this movie. I call her my niece, and I wanted us to have this bond, and so I took her to see it, and I wanted her to fall in love with the movie the same way I did. So we go to see the movie, and I'm watching her reaction to the movie as much as I'm watching the movie itself, and I, I can't quite figure out what she thinks about it. She's got this pained look on her face, and she looks so serious. And when we left the theater, this girl who can talk had nothing to say. And we got in the car and we started driving and she was just quiet and she looked so pensive and she's looking out the window. And so finally I just had to ask her if she liked the movie because I was dying. And, and this was supposed to be our bonding moment. And she said, Aunt Sunita, why didn't Annie's parents want her? Why didn't they know how special she is? And her comments broke my heart. See, she was only five or six at the time, and we talked about adoption and the choices that parents sometimes have to make. And I'm thinking to myself that this conversation is way above my pay grade as auntie. <laughs> and so I'm still wondering if she liked the movie or if I just traumatized this girl. <laughs> and then she says, when I get home, I want to donate all my old clothes to orphans. And at this point, I am just, you know, my heart is melting. 
I am so proud of her. And I told her that I thought that was a great idea. And we talked about it more and more. And she was so excited. And, and then, then she finally said, do you have the song? And so we looked up the song. And I realized by then she liked the movie. And so we, we spent the rest of the ride home singing the songs from the soundtrack. And, 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 and I was excited because she loved the movie. But I was even more excited because I realized that something had taken place in that moment with her watching this movie, right? That something had touched her heart, that her heart was so tender and open. And so she watched this movie and she found this character and she found a way to relate just to a character in a movie. And because she had such deep compassion, such care for this character in the movie that she couldn't sit by and watch a character be in pain without trying to figure out a way to help her herself. She had a compassion that I had not realized a five-year-old could have. And I, I love that about her. And we, we come here today and, and we do this annually. We, we gather around the country in churches and community centers and schools to celebrate a man who we know had such a care and compassion for humanity, so much so that he gave his life for it. And he invited all of us to dream with him for something that he called the beloved community. It's one founded on reconciliation and love. He talks about it in his I Have a Dream speech when he says things like the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. And he, he goes on later in his life, he's going to talk about the poor people's campaign and the end to the Vietnam War. He was a man of freedom and justice because he cared for other people. And here we are 50 years after his death, and I ask myself, not negating the tremendous strides we have made, but Dr. King, how do we get to the beloved community? How do we get there? How do we get to that freedom and that justice that you dream about? And I think the answer is found with my niece. She's so brilliant. So is her brother. And I think it's found in the text that I read for you this morning. See, the key to arriving at that beloved community that King identifies and that Paul leads us to here in verse 25, it says just this, that there would be no dissension within the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Hallelujah. The same care for one another. Yeah. Now, throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is speaking to a church in turmoil, and in this chapter, he reminds them of who they are as a church community. They are the body of Christ, and as such, they are to be united. And he tells them that their members should have the same care for one another. So it seems simple. We've heard this term so many times before, but what does it look like? What does same care look like? And I, and I had to go back, and this is why I love the Bible, because you can't take things at face value. When you go back to the original Greek word, the word for care is merimnao. It means anxious about, worry, to have anxiety over or be concerned about. And interestingly, do you know where else we find this same term in the Bible? It's in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus tells us, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. It's in these same verses that Jesus will tell us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then all the other things that we're worrying about will be added unto us. But we have to ask ourselves, what is Jesus responding to? when he says this. He's responding to our tendency to worry, to be anxious, to be concerned about ourselves so deeply that sometimes we can't sleep. And sometimes we can't eat, right? We, we can't go to work, we can't get up out of the bed. And isn't it interesting that this is the same kind of concern that Paul 
says that we are to have for someone else, that we're to have for one another. Paul tells us to have the same level of concern for others and their well-being as we would have for ourselves. That same level of heightened fear and anxiety and worry and concern that keeps you up at night should keep you up at night about your neighbor. Now, of course, the same way we, that we pray and we seek God and we trust him for ourselves, we trust him for our brother and sister. But the point is that the concern is so deep for the other person that it calls you to that place of desperation and persistence in prayer. So we have to ask ourselves this morning, when was the last time your heart broke for someone else? Now, I'm not talking about your spouse or your child, or your best friend, or someone you know. I'm talking about people you don't know. Did your heart break when you saw the devastation in Puerto Rico this fall, or when you saw the mudslides earlier this week in California? Were you worried about them? Were you concerned about them? Did it keep you up at night? Did you pray for them? Did you donate money? Have you reached out to figure out how you can help? I was in my last year of law school when Katrina hit New Orleans. And at the time, you know, Oprah and Anderson Cooper, they were on the ground and they, it just seemed like it was 24 hours a day. You were just watching the aftermath, the death and the destruction and the loss of property and stability. And it was awful. And it broke my heart and I prayed and I prayed about it. I became so anxious about it that I had to stop watching the news because it just tore me apart too much. And, and at some point, the law school dean decided that she was gonna make a statement that said they were gonna do anything they could to help out people in New Orleans. And me and my friends were just naive enough to take her at her word. And so we got in a bus and we drove to New Orleans. And we spent a week not doing law-related stuff, because at this point, there was no law-related stuff to do. We were just helping people take the sheetrock down from their homes to expose the wooden beams so that the, uh, the, um, the inspectors, the uh, insurance inspectors could come and see if there was any value still left in their home. And, and we, we traveled there more than once in law school and every time I even get remotely close to New Orleans. I need to go and travel and see about the Lower Ninth Ward because I'm still concerned about them. Now, I know that you may not have the time or resources to jump at every natural disaster that comes your way, but we are a praying people. And at the very least, we ought to be on our knees praying about what's going on in our country. There's a part of you that should be concerned about one another. Martin Luther King's nonviolence movement was about getting people to care that if people could see what the police were doing to nonviolent protesters, then they would act. If they could see peaceful protesters, people just sitting at lunch counters, children walking into a school building and the backlash they received, the dogs, the fire hoses, the spitting, the yelling, public opinion would change. And that's what happened. It took the video footage and the newspaper articles, the death, the bombing of 16th Street Baptist Church and the murder of four little girls in Sunday school. It took Emmett Till and Medgar Evers. That's how he got people to care. Yes, yes. And I'm glad he did. But I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that if we call ourselves Christians and lovers of justice, we shouldn't have to wait for people to die in order to care. Jesus didn't make it a practice of waiting for people to die in order to heal their pain. We know when wrong is wrong and we've got to start calling it out. Policies that are founded on prejudice and a belief that some are more deserving than others are wrong and unchristlike. Norwegians are no better than Haitians and El Salvadorians and Hondurans and Africans. The rich are no better than the poor. And at some point, we have to decide as Christians that the only God we serve is the Lord. And we are not and will not be beholden to any political party or any politician. We are on God's agenda. And if you want our vote, you get on our agenda. 
this country towards caring for one another. We are designed to care about one another. That's what, why Paul uses this body metaphor. We are the body of Christ. And we are designed by God to be interrelated. Earlier in chapter 12, Paul is talking about the different gifts found in the church and how necessary and dependent upon, the, and how necessary and dependent upon one another they are. And the same is true for us. Our very lives are dependent upon the well-being of others. One of my professors, Lonnie Guineer, talks about the canary in the mine. The metaphor derives from a time when miners used cage canaries to determine lethal amounts of gas within the mines. If there was any methane or carbon monoxide in the mine, the canary would die, and the men would know that it's unsafe to go down there. My professor says, that people of color are often the canaries in the mind for the rest of the country. The injustices and conditions found in some communities of color warn us of larger systemic ills that ultimately threaten everyone. So if we were to pay closer attention to distressed communities, we would make greater progress in our nation as a whole. You see, if we had paid attention to the crack epidemic, and let me be clear that it is proven that those drugs were pushed into urban communities, if we had paid attention to the crack epidemic, we would have been better prepared to handle the meth epidemic and now the opioid epidemic. We see, it's not a war on criminals. It's a health crisis. It's not a war. It's a health crisis, but only now are we paying attention. We are interdependent. And if we don't pay attention to when things affect others, it soon comes for us. It's the sentiment of the poem written by German Lutheran pastor Martin Niemöller. First they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Martin Luther King would say it this way, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Care requires deep concern for the other. We are interdependent. But not only does care necessitate deep concern, it also calls us to remove the pain. Care calls us to remove the pain. Verse 26 says, if one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. He's talking about the mutual participation in the good or bad condition of the other. And if we have a deep concern for the other and the other is in pain, the only natural thing to do is to alleviate the pain. Yes. When your foot steps on a nail, your whole body reacts. Your back bends over. Your stomach contracts, your mouth cries out, your head stoops down, your eyes look down, your hand touches the wound. You look to see where the damage is done and where the pain is coming from. But you don't just observe the situation, you do something about it. You don't just say, oh, I have a nail in my foot, and keep going. No, you first seek to remove the nail the source of the pain, and then you seek to heal the injury. That's why, not, that's why just being educated is not enough anymore. That's only the first step. But what's a diagnosis without a treatment? You go to the doctor, you already know you're in pain. You don't need him to tell you that. You need the treatment. What am I going to do about it? This is not just about joining in sympathy anymore, ladies and gentlemen, but about actively working to stop the pain, remove the cause, and work toward healing. This is how care is properly carried out. 
And unfortunately, too many of us stop caring if we ever did so at all and never moved to action. One of Martin Luther King's most profound pieces of writing is his letter from a Birmingham jail. If you have never read it, that is your homework tonight. Get it online, letter from a Birmingham jail. He wrote it in 1963 in jail from Birmingham where he had been arrested on Good Friday for leading nonviolent protests in response to discrimination, housing, business, and voting. Churches and homes of black people were being bombed without repercussion and talks and negotiations with politicians such as the notorious Bull Connor had gone nowhere. So King and others planned boycotts and protests and were ultimately arrested. Yet despite all that people were enduring and that the city and now the country was watching them endure, many people, even in the church, condemned them. So on the same day of the mass protests, eight clergymen, two Catholic bishops, two Methodist bishops, a rabbi, an Episcopalian bishop, a moderator in the Presbyterian church, and a local Baptist minister wrote a letter to the Birmingham community strongly urging black people to withdraw support from the demonstrations because the clergy said it was unwise and untimely. They accused the demonstrators of inciting hatred and violence by their extreme methods. They ended their letter by appealing to the black community to quote, observe the principles of law and order and common sense. And although we all might be appalled, at that letter, the fact of the matter is they were not alone in their refusal to support the civil rights movement. Did you know that there were almost, that there were about 500 churches in Birmingham at the time, and only about 20 supported the Birmingham campaign? It's less than 1%. The local church turned its back when justice demanded otherwise. So King wrote in response in his letter, in deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ, but oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being nonconformist. Those are Dr. King's words. And King also identifies three types of people he has encountered over the years whose lack of care led to their complacency. I'm rephrasing a bit to make it easier for you to remember. The first is the waiter, the waiter. This is the person who sees the problem but is, quote, <clears throat> excuse me, from Dr. King, more devoted to order than justice, who prefers a negative piece, which is the absence of tension, to a positive piece, which is the presence of justice. This person just wants everyone to sit down and be quiet and wait. He or she believes that they can set the timetable for another person's freedom. This is the type of person who will go with the flow and will expect change to happen on its own. The, we see a lot of these people now saying how inappropriate it is to take a knee, a silent protest, that this is not the time or the place. It'll work itself out. The second is the warn. This is the person who, quote, as a result of long years of oppression, are so drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodiness that they have adjusted to the status quo. Now, we know these people, too. There has been so much trauma in their lives that they have become numb. Yeah. It's just too much. Their goal is only survival, not resistance. And the third is the well-off. This is the person who, quote, because of a degree of academic and economic security, and in some ways may benefit from other people's oppression, has become insensitive to the problems of others. These are the people who know that they have something to lose. And the major problem with these types of people is that they're complacent and they don't do anything and they're around us and they're some of us. If we're honest, too many of us just don't care. And we're in the church and we're in the community all around us. We see the homeless and we hold our noses. 
We see the hungry and we look away. We see the women being stolen from their countries and sold so men can use them and we turn the channel. We see the police brutality, the inadequate school systems, the uninsured and the people who've been neglected by our society and yet so often we do nothing. King warns us though that we will have to repent in this generation not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people but for the appalling silence of the good people. Yeah. Because too many of us can't bear the thought of doing the hard, dirty, self-sacrificing work of helping another person, of removing the pain. When I was in college, I had to take a swimming class to graduate. And I passed the class, but I never really learned how to swim that well because I didn't trust the teacher. And the reason I didn't trust the teacher was because he never got in the water with us. <laughs> you see, I didn't care that he was the varsity swim coach. I never saw him get wet. He taught the class from the side of the pool, but I needed him to get in the pool with me. I needed him to be on my level. I needed him to show me what he wanted me to do. And I think that's the reason why so many people are disillusioned by hollow cries of justice, especially from the church. We don't get in there with them and help them remove the pain. They hear us talking about how God is so good, he can heal them, but we don't come to them and show them. They hear us talk about how our God is a God of freedom, but we don't help them work towards that freedom. They hear us talk about how God loves them, but we never show them the love of Christ. Why would they believe us? I have an old friend who said once, Christians pray a good game. Yeah, yeah, it hurt me too. Meaning we talk a lot, but we don't do anything. And we hide behind our prayers as if that's all that God requires of us. But we know that God requires more, right? We know that Jesus didn't just preach and teach in the synagogues. He didn't just sit and study with the disciples who already knew he was the Christ, right? He went and he ate with the sinners. He healed the sick. He fed those who were hungry. He brought freedom to those who were burdened by sin in them circumstances. But I have to tell you, and doc, this is why you got to read Dr. King's letter. He's, these words, they haunt me today. He says, Dr. King says, I have traveled the length and breadth of Alabama, Mississippi, and all the other southern states. On sweltering summer days and crisp autumn mornings, I have looked at the South's beautiful churches with their lofty spires pointing heavenward. I have beheld the impressive outlines of their massive religious education buildings. Over and over, I have found myself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? And then he asked a bunch of where were they questions. And I had to sit back and think to myself, I wonder who is sitting around now thinking I have traveled through Inglewood, Teaneck, Hackensack, Tenafly, and I've seen the million dollar buildings and the breathtaking stained glass windows, the education wings and the family life centers, the technology and the Grammy worthy worship teams. What kind of people worship there? Who is their God? What do they do? What does he do? Where were they when I was evicted? Where were they when I went to jail? Where were they when I was falsely accused? Where were they when my husband beat me, when my mother was on drugs, when tiki torches and Confederate flags were being held up by people marching in city streets yelling, yelling blood and soil, which is a Nazi phrase, when I was qualified for the job but overlooked? When I told you it happened to me too. Care demands that we help remove the pain. And we know how to do it. 
but we tend to rally around those things that are easy for us, those things that are comfortable for us. But we know how to do it. In May of 2016, just a few days before Easter, a fire erupted at First Presbyterian Church in Inglewood. You all remember. It destroyed much of the sanctuary. And the outpouring of love and support for that congregation was overwhelming across denominations and faith traditions and and everyone, even one of the Jewish synagogues offered up their space so they could have worship on Sunday mornings. It was truly a unified and concerned people. It was a beautiful moment in God's economy. It was a good time. But then I wonder, where was that support when people started talking about folks dying in the streets? Where was the support when we talked about Black Lives Mattering too? Why were there so many people dying and not enough people doing anything? Those of us who claim to value life so dearly turn away when life was taken away. And some even defended it. People are in pain. Black and brown communities are in pain. And too many in the church haven't stopped to look at the problem or even bothered to help remove the pain. So what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Because that's why we're here, right? What do you do? You pay attention. right? Some of us don't even pay attention. We've got to start paying attention. We've got to start reading and watching the news and talking to someone outside of your circle. You have to go to the site of the injury. Brian Stevenson is a lawyer and the founder and director of Equal Justice Initiative, and he talks about being in proximity with those people who are hurting and are on the margins. You can't help someone standing on the side of the pool. You got to get in there someday, right? You've got to help relieve the pain, help find a solution, and work with those people who are in the situation to find a solution. Organize with other like-minded people in your churches, in your community. Paul says to have the same care. If you're looking for issues, I've got a couple for you. The kids in Inglewood need some help. Go to a school board meeting and help them. Help them know that someone is holding them accountable for the education of our children in this city. Ex-offenders need jobs. Do you own a business? Can you hire someone? Are you looking? There are single parents who need some support in our community. Do you want me to go on? Because we have to do this ourselves. If we're looking for answers to come from the White House, they will never come. So at some point, we've got to be the church. At some point, we've got to be the agents of change. We've got to be the ones to help alleviate the pain in our communities. And this, this is so important because, and I can't say it enough, When the church is silent, people die. It's just that serious. So we've got to get moving and push harder. But I wouldn't be here this afternoon and certainly would not have marched outside in 20 degrees temperature if I didn't believe that we still had hope, right? If I still didn't believe that we could do this. Because I do believe in the power of the church. I believe in the power of God to work through the church. The church is God's creation, not ours. And the church is the witness to the world of God's power over disregard and complacency and evil. Paul's example of the body shows us what the goal is. It is to be the body of Christ in the world. It's actually unnatural for us not to care about one. And I think we overlook what it means when we say that we are the body of Christ. We are bound together in Jesus Christ. Christ calls us, the church, his body. And we are the only body 
Christ now has in the world. Do you realize the incredible risk Christ is taking on us, that he is entrusting his body and his witness to us, to us, to all of us. He's, in taking, he's taking an incredible risk on us. And either he's crazy, right? Or he believes that he has equipped us for the task of showing the world what community looks like, what justice looks like, what freedom looks like, what love for brother and sister looks like. I think Jesus knows what he's doing. See, Jesus knows that he prayed for us. He says in John 17 that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you and me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. He knows that he has prayed for us. He knows what he's asking of us is countercultural and supernatural, but he also told us, do not be conformed to this world. And he also knows that we are connected to the supernatural, that we're connected to the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It lives inside of each one of us in the church. Because I believe that our gospel is not just a spiritual gospel. It's not one of these things that we just sing about on Sunday morning or on Mondays on Martin Luther King Day. It's not this feel-good gospel where you go home to your same situation. There's no power in that. If God can't change social problems, then that means that the devil is stronger and more powerful and in more control than the God that we serve. But my God is sovereign. And my God is still in control. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth and they that dwell therein. My God is the same God that can move mountains and can part seas and topple governments and lift the oppressed. He can give babies to barren women and make the sun stand still when he wants to. He can save people from fiery furnaces and keep lions from devouring us. He can slay giants and destroy nations and he can lay himself down and pick himself back up when he wants to. That's the same kind of God that's still at work in the church freeing us from this bondage, but he's looking for some people to do some work. Some people who say they love Jesus and some people who say they want to be like him, who are not afraid to let the Lord use them when they get up from their knees in prayer, who are not afraid of being a little uncomfortable and a little dirty, who are not afraid of getting off of your seat and out of the pews and out into the streets where there are people who need to know about a saving God. He's looking for some people who don't mind lifting their voices and causing a stir, who will work towards a day where we don't choose where we live by the school system because every school is good for our kids. That we don't have to worry about being harassed and no one believing us. He's looking for some people who will go alongside some men and help them find their value in God and not in wielding power over other people. God is looking for some people who want to ensure that, yes, all lives matter, including black lives. God is looking for some people who don't just want to sit here on Martin Luther King Day on a Monday afternoon and talk about what we're going to do, but who will make the commitment that when we come back here in 2019, that it's a testimony service, that we will be able to talk about what God has done in this community through the work of his people. Who will take God at his word when he says that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or imagine, according to the power that works in us. This is about a new day. 
uneducated. Our seniors don't have the help and relief that they need. We can't keep doing this, brothers and sisters. Power is being wasted on us. That we have God's power working in and through us, and most especially when we come together as the body of Christ, Amen. united as one, that when we come here next year, that we're going to celebrate the goodness of God and what he has done through us together. May God bless you. And keep you.